Thank you very much. It's always a pleasure to be here in Stockholm, and it's even a greater pleasure to be succeeding a speaker who not only is perfect in advocating patients' role. Like I uh, said, we've created uh, a, um, a charter in 2011 to make sure that patients' voice would be included in every healthcare conference in all in the world. And a lot of uh, conferences have followed that example, luckily, and it's great to see that these kind of voices, in instead of talking about patients, but together with patients, are also exemplified here at the Digital Health Days again. So that makes my job today a bit easier, so I don't have to stress out how important the voice of patients are. So let me step into some of the other things. Why is it that with all the great technology that, for instance, Robin showed, that healthcare still is using sticks to make fire? Because that's the case. It's not about the passion. I meet great colleagues, great healthcare professionals who strive on a daily basis to cure that one disease or to figure out that one treatment that really actually works. But still, if you have to go to the doctor's office, you have to take a day off. You have to burn fossils to get to the hospital to find that very one parking spot to rush to the department, go up there two minutes early for your appointment, and then the nurse says, wait, the doctor is running late. Take a seat in the waiting room. And once you're in the, in the doctor's office, let's be honest, a couple of minutes later, you're out. Back home again, burning fossils. That's how we still uh, have organized healthcare. In a world that's connected everywhere and everybody that, that's connected into it, of course. So let me ask you this question. Who of you in the audience is taking his own blood pressure at home? Thank you. Well, that's like, let's say, half of you. Who of you has sent that data into the doctor's office lately? And it's zero. Why is it? Why is it that still there's technology out there that's FDA-approved, CE checkmark, being reimbursed already, at least in some of the European company, uh, uh, countries, still not is being used on a wide scale? Let me try another one. Video conference. Who of you has Skyped or FaceTimed or whatever with one of your peers, your family, or friends in the last, let's say, week? Thank you. Who has done that same thing, video conference with his healthcare professional, in the last year? And it's three or four, great. And the thing is that it's already there, but still is not embedded in a mainstream situation where we deliver healthcare. And just to wrap up the last question and about urine analysis, no, I won't ask you how many of you did this lately. <laughs> but you know how this feels to take this little pea pot, bring it into the doctor's office in, in, this, in this little plastic bag, and everybody knows what you're bringing, right? So why is it not being used that this little stick from Scanadu, for instance, that costs something like three bucks, would be able to dip in the urine in your own comfort of your own home, wait 60 seconds, take a picture of the little stick, and within four seconds give you the results of the 12 most common urine analysis? including whether or not you're pregnant, which would be an interesting one in my case, as you can imagine, but still. Okay, and, s and also stepping up in terms of robotics. This is a machine that uh, claims to be able to, within, let me start the video, within uh, 1.2 minutes to take the two first rounds of blood without the intervention of a nurse or a physician. If you cannot handle blood taking, you should look the other way in a couple of seconds. But just to give you an idea, it's a completely autonomous device that maybe in one day will sit next to the empty bottle machine in your supermarket. Just go figure to see how these kind of things run. Or technology that's uh, so less invasive, like this little um, uh, patch that you could connect to your chest, and with it, for three or four days on a row, take your nine vital signs from heart rate, respiration rate, uh, skin temperature, uh, and a validated 1K uh, EKG, for instance. It's all technology that's being out there. Just like this Tesla suit, and for this time, it's not something from Elon Musk, but it's a suit completely packed with sensors and motors, and the physiotherapist at the left is being able to run physiotherapy remotely, like 100 miles away from the patient in that case. Things are getting smaller. 
Whereas we take an EKG in hospital, 12 lead EKG like this, at the back of my phone there's a little strip on it that I can take um, a 1K validated EKG from a live core cardiac called uh, nowadays, being sent in to three cardiologists that have divided the world in three different time zones, and you can imagine what happens. 24 hours a day, somebody is keeping a watch on you. And by the way, the watch, the Apple Watch, the same company that created this little sleeve now also has created a wristband for the Apple Watch, being able to do the same thing 24 hours a day. And I've been given this business card lately that supposedly also was able for 28 cents to also run an EKG, but that's rubbish, of course. All the three other ones are completely FDA approved and evidence-based, but trust me, Within a year from now, a business card like that will exist. Stuff is getting smaller and into everyday technology that you use. These are my earbuds from Dash Braggy. It's completely wireless. You can recharge them. I can listen to Spotify. I can make a phone call with Robin. And I even can look, if I look up in the sky for three seconds, it would say, hey, Lucian, you're in Stockholm. Let me read you the weather report. Meanwhile, measuring my heart rate, oxygenation level, stress level, skin temperature, and these kind of things. This is technology that's getting into technology that you use on an everyday basis. Seen the Apple keynote lately, last week? Announcing, oh, so this is uh, a, a bigger picture, 128 sensors in, the, in, in these little chaps. And Apple, like I said, also recently announced the, uh, the earpods. And you can wait for the moment in time when Apple also starts to incorporate these kind of sensors in it. But let's be honest, who of you ever have watched the series of Star Trek back in the mid-70s? Yeah, so there was something promised to us already back then, right? Which was the medical tricorder. This is a tricorder from Star Trek. This is an original prop. You would have seen this used by Spock, also Dr. McCoy. A tricorder is a, it's a multifunction device. It's a computer, it's a scanner, it's an analyzer, it's a sensor, it's used for science, for medicine, all kinds of things. Uh, it is like an iPad on steroids. It was promised to us, but still, it yet not exists. But that is going to change. Peter Diamandis, who is the chair of the XPRIZE, also issued an XPRIZE for the creation of the medical tricorder. The medical tricorder was funded with a 10 million bucks prize for that group that actually puts a doctor in a box, being able to run a couple of diagnostics specifically and also to measure some of the vitals in real time. So I think at the present it's like six or five finalists from 280 that originally stepped up. And this is an example of a Canadian company, which is called CloudDX, who has created this system that uh, is not, by the way, you, you might think that that's a stethoscope, but it's a device for the patient to wear, and it measures 19 uh, uh, diagnostics from one run, including blood taking, urine analysis, and all kinds of other stuff. So this is coming because the... Th the the, the, the ambition that thrives from these kinds of prices is greatly um, uh, challenging entrepreneurs to really run these kind of things. And things get smaller. From wearables, we now go into very small stuff. This is Neural Dust from UC Berkeley that's able to be sprinkled, so to say, on top of your brains, connected to a node on top of your skull, and with that sent the data indeed into the cloud. So from wearables, we now go into the era that I like to call incitables as the next step from it. So these are some of the technology that I've been showing you. See the pattern right here? Getting smaller, getting near to you. This is what I call the delocalization of healthcare. From, top, from academical healthcare, we'll go into top clinical healthcare, into supermarket healthcare next to your home. And that's what a lot of people say, actually, that we'll run from hospital to home. And I don't think that's really true. I think there's an extra step coming into it, like Robin said. Everything is going to be connected to that one hub that's 24-7 at elbow reach of you. This device is going to handle your healthcare, is going to handle your health like it's handling your, uh, your life already. And we've done some calculations in Radboud, what this means for, for instance, our real estate uh, forecasts. 
we've calculated that within seven years from now, 70% of all the routine stuff that we're doing at Radboud no longer is being done at our campus. And that's not only a change from bricks to bytes, the most important challenge that we have is behavior. Let's face it, great technology out there already and we don't use it. Might that be because we maybe are afraid of losing our jobs from robots or other ones? I don't know. Let's be honest. If we preview what's heading to healthcare, we'll see that in the next 20 years from now, the number of people above 65 almost will double. Healthcare demand will almost double, and I don't think that there will be a lot of extra budget for healthcare. So we have to come up with smart things and start using technology that's already out there. So one would say, that's great, so we are doing this right now. Well, not really. In my opinion, there's a different reality. It's a reality of politics, where, for instance, the CEO of the American Medical Association calls digital products the modern snake oil. And that's an organization that's representing physicians in America, neglecting digital health for the past 10 years, and now all of a sudden say, the only way that this is going to work is when we are connected to it. Go figure. All that technology that I showed you is being driven by physicians. Physicians in the board and, and, and also in the advisory boards, of course. The thing is that people start hyping the technology, but the technology is not the change. The permanent state of change, that's what's changing. The moment in time when we were validating this little device, the patch that I showed you, when we've submitted the article for it, the day it was published, a Korean company stepped up to us, claiming that they would do twice the amount of measurements for half the money. So before we already got this into the hands of our physicians and nurses, it already got outdated. So it's the change and not only about the technology. And that's an interesting thing to, to witness within healthcare. Healthcare actually has become an innovation flatliner already. Every step we take, we should know what the next step would be and what the outcome would be. It's a completely risk mitigating system. Of course, we should take care of patients. But in Silicon Valley, Friday afternoon, somebody published an app. And all of a sudden, as a dermatologist, your world changed in the weekend. And the interesting thing that happens is what I describe as the pre-gap. We bring in all kinds of barriers why this would not work. Like, it's not safe, it's not approved, it's not reimbursed, patients do not want these kind of stuff. Yeah, same goes for that little device that I showed you from a life core. They are keep striving on, and meanwhile, they get it FDA approved. Healthcare insurance companies are paying for this. Patients do want it and use it. They've already made their 1.5 million EKG lately. And that's an interesting thing. Then we start to work as healthcare, and that's basically when you're too late. That's when a Uber comes into healthcare. And interesting enough, and that's also about the behavior where stuff does not work, once something gets wrong, we exemplify that. Anybody ever heard about Theranos, the company with the one drop of blood? And, uh, and we've been using this example for, let's say, for a year as a great opportunity how healthcare works. Now it's being used completely different, and everybody says, oh yeah, that's great, Lucian, about that innovation. It's just like Theranos, right? We need evidence. Sure, we need evidence. But it's also that evidence, every once in a while, also is not correct. Let's face it, there were crooks in the Middle Ages, and there will be crooks in the future as well. I think we have to start taking innovation in healthcare serious just as we do pharma development. We know that we have to create all kinds of, uh, of tryouts and products that maybe not even will go into the market in the end of the day, and that's fine. But in healthcare and innovation, we only want to be at 100% success prior to the moment in time when we start with it. For instance, this is a, a, a doctor shop at um, Amsterdam uh, Central Station, where you could go in, it's a pharmacist, you can take your, uh, your medication, you can have a checkup indeed, and all these kind of solution shops will pop up in train stations, in supermarkets like in the US, and even in gas stations, again. Has anybody thought about what we're going to do with all these gas stations when we all start driving electrically? I don't know. 
Maybe, meanwhile, you're charging your Tesla. Do a health checkup, for instance. Maybe it's an idea. Let's face it, we're in the midst of the fourth industrial revolution, as the World Economic Forum by its chairman Schwab says. We'll go from small innovation waves into a tsunami that also will bring us um, uh, innovations that will accumulate. And from small product innovation, will migrate into system innovation. We really have to change the systems. And entrepreneurship is very key in that. We're also in the fifth, democratization. And we all of, uh, in this audience have been there. We all have booked our flights online. We are listening music online. We read our newspapers online. And those are markets that you can choose for. But there's that one market that all these big corporates are now heading for that nobody gets to choose for. Because at one point in your life, you're next. So that's at the convergence of patience, empowerment, and technology, where there's a huge market coming up. And that's also what you see. And it's also so that I think that healthcare will become a software branch. Just like the New York Stock Exchange. This is the New York Stock Exchange in the mid-60s. All kinds of uh, men with all kinds of funny colored hats shouting through each other about trading stocks and bonds. This is the same spot, 16 working stations. Only 3% of all the stocks and, uh, are being traded verbally. The rest is done by algorithms. Interesting enough, the same amount of people working at New York Stock Exchange, but now in a different role, keeping those algorithms healthy and up and running. And that's the analogy what I uh, foresee also for healthcare. This is an ICU nurse I visited in Phoenix, Arizona, with a Philips working station supervising 250 ICU patients in the region as an extra nurse, additionally to the ones at place. And that's also one of the reasons why we now are working at a telehealth and telemedicine center, not only for that high acute healthcare, but also for the next step, which is the outer ring for all, connecting all these devices and some people call it gadgets, to really also make sense out of that. Because we have to discriminate the signal from the noise, and I even think that that needs a completely new profession. And uh, I will talk about that later on. With delocalizing healthcare, we also got that this other opportunity, and Robin touched on that already. Within the next 10 years, 3 to 5 billion people will come online. Let's face it, if we're able to delocalize healthcare with technology, we're able to run and strive for a bigger and um, uh, a, a better global health. I've been in ambulance services for over 35 years, and, uh, and prior to the lunch, for instance, we've seen everything from womb to tomb, as they say. So that makes you not only small, but also try to be realistic and also to see uh, how things are running. My father had a great, uh, a, a very big heart attack. And imagine if I, back then and now, would be able to send all these data and somebody would keep and watch on me. And I really think that the moment in time will, will occur where I, based on predictive analytics, an ambulance drives up to my curbstone, rings my bell, I open the door, I see a former colleague of mine, he said, hey Lucian, I'm here for the cardiac arrest. I would say, there's no cardiac arrest right here. And he said, well, want to bet? Within 10 minutes from now, that will be the case based on our data. So have a seat, we're here, we're taking good care of you already. We will step into the era for the first time in history when we will be there when somebody gets sick. And the coin will flip. Patients will create more data themselves than we as healthcare professionals. And that's the moment in time where we will start to subscribing to the data of patients as opposed to the other way around, which is the current case. So, how to work with this? How to get to that shore in the end of the day? We should show and tell, like these kind of conferences. We should increase the validation based on research. But we also have to come up with different research models. From an N is 500 to, for instance, a N is 100,000 times N is 1, for instance, which is a completely different system. We have to experiment and fail fast and a lot, of course. And we also, by the way, have to rebalance privacy and comfort. There's no such thing as 100% security. There always will be a hacker smarter than the best system. And I think it's an unethical thing for governments and other also institutions to try to picture a, a future where there's such a thing like 100% security into it. 
we have to change and we have to talk also to our colleagues to show them that we can use everyday technology that is becoming a medical device to make healthcare location independent in the end of the day and also to be able to share that data not only with patient peers but also to donate it for scientific research. And with that, we also could free up resources to help those that are really, really in need of it. With that, we try to engage our own community at Rodwood University Medical Center to take a, an alley that's called Digital First, Physical Next. For those patients who are able to and really want to be able to do stuff digitally, we'll offer them a digital alley by default. For those who cannot or do not want, we still have the original kind of healthcare, of course. It's basically the same as in electronic banking, right? Where you do everything in the comfort of your own home, but at one point in time for some decisions, you go into the banker's office. Professionals, like I said, will start to subscribing to, the, to patients' data in the end of the day, and I actually think that this will happen in 2017 already. And we all can help. Everyone can help. Each patient can help. Each person can help by asking your physician or nurse if there was an option for another way to run this as opposed to step into the doctor's office, for instance, um, um, uh, and, and really to take care of that. With that, we really could create an environment where patients are not only included, but also have the opportunity to finally be the expert in their own healthcare. But this is about crossing borders. It's about crossing boundaries, actually. And I want to close up with a small video about the most innovative species in the world. You might think that that's humans, but it's not. It's penguins. Penguins are the most innovative species in the world, and this little video shows you how they run about crossing borders. And just picture the rope in the middle as the innovation, and just let's see how they work with that. Hey, there's a challenge. Let's see what happens. Some people don't think, they just cross the border, stumble and fall, get up and rise, some uh, people think how to work with that. The chap in the middle looks away and thinks, maybe tomorrow it's gone when I'm awake again. And other ones try to, uh, to, to, to really to try and fail. And that's how you innovate, right? It, not, not everything is solid, not everything is known. You see the resistance in the middle. And even when two or three more people cross the boundaries, you also see the unions. Just let's keep our jobs. That's not the way to go, and whenever one or two extra people cross the line, you see a typically human reaction at the right side of the rope. Okay, guys, that's it. Let's have coffee. coffee. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lucian. Thank not you. only for this entertaining video, and truly inspiring. If penguins can do it, we also can do it. Me personally, I have lots of questions for you as I'm in your fan club after what everything you've done for patients and including Thank them you very much. in the program. But I know that our fantastic commentators over there, the cage, the cage, <laughs> <laughs> have been on <coughs> online, and I guess we have some reactions from our Twitter feed. If you can share this with us, and then we jump to questions to Lucian. Yeah, definitely. Um, Lucian, thank you so much. Uh, one of the things I love about you is your amazing ability to predict the future. And within that tone, I think one of the things that I'm going to pass off to Bastian is, is why, why is the future coming so slowly? We heard from Robin that a lot of this technology is quite old. So uh, I think we have a great question from Twitter, actually. Yeah, actually, uh, uh, just now I sent out a poll to ask people, uh, followers, uh, whether or not they are sending out their data to their physician or to their healthcare worker. Um, and I got one response from Glenn Big Bilby, who is also here on the conference. You can see his stand over there, uh, who mentioned that he cannot even send his banking data to his accountant, uh, which is ludicrous, of course. 
Um, which brings me to, uh, to my own uh, uh, question as well. Um, when you're looking at how people are interacting with their healthcare workers, um, you can see that, especially here in Sweden, uh, but also in many other countries in the Nordic part of uh, Europe, that there is constantly uh, a fear of privacy, fear of your data being exposed to the big bad world of the internet. Um, how do you look at that? Do you think that the, the world of uh, the internet is actually preventing uh, people from sending their data because of the fear of privacy? Well, I think that privacy and security, let's combine those, of course, uh, is an issue. <coughs> we should not neglect that. Let's face it, if your data is out there and somebody can get a hold on that and do stuff with, with it that you don't want, that's not a good thing to do. The other thing, however, is that the opportunities at the other side are not really balanced. Mm -hmm. Sure enough, we have to make um, uh, um, secure connections and we have to come up with standards and also legislation for these kind of things. But like I said, there will be crooks in the future as well. So if we keep striving for that 100% security and privacy, that's not going to work, I think. The other thing is that I don't think that it's so secure right now <coughs> as well. A lot of patients write their stuff down in their booklet, for instance, which also could vanish whenever you, and I don't hope that that will occur, of course, have some fire within your home or your mm -hmm. office or whatever. So I think that the challenge is to rebalance and mm -hmm. to open the debate in terms of how to work with this. And I do think that it's also different from somebody with a chronic condition mm -hmm. as opposed to somebody who's ha having some symptoms and tries to find whatever is out there. The other thing, and that's, I think, a typical Dutch approach, maybe, in the Netherlands we got, uh, we don't have a selection bias for healthcare insurance companies, for instance. So it does not matter whether or not you have been sick in the past to be accepted at a different healthcare insurance company, mm -hmm. which is different in some other countries. Mm -hmm. So two things, I think we have to face that it's nothing uh, near a 100% solution in the end of the day. And secondly, this is going to occur anyway, and I really should think that we should open the debate for that. That's great. So, do you have any more questions? I think we have too many, but fortunately, yeah. we're interviewing you and Robin at 10.30 and doing an in-depth, so, um, and as decided, I'm gonna be the bad cop this year, yeah. so uh, come on over at yeah. then and watch us during the FICA break. And also, uh, to mention again, if you have any questions that you want us to ask, uh, use the hashtag DHD16 on Twitter. Uh, so we can ask them for you. Uh, mm -hmm. During the interviews, uh, we will be asking the majority of questions that we get in via Twitter. I mean, Sebastian, Thank I you. could ask you the same question that you posed to me. How do you, <laughs> as a patient, think about these kind of things in terms of privacy and how to work with that, with your own experience? Yeah. So we'll take this yeah. discussion for an interview. Stay we tuned. It will be broadcasted online. Okay. And we are looking forward to discussion between two of you. With this, we would like to say thank you, Lucien, for this fantastic presentation, for so much food for thought. And we are going to present our next keynote speaker. Thank you very much.